Okay. Um, this week, I have asked, as part of our Testify series, I, well, actually, I didn't ask this week. I asked, like, a month ago, um, for Kate DeBoer, if she would be willing to come up and share her testimony. And then, rather than letting her get all stressed out, I, I told her Friday night, by the way, you're doing this Sunday. So she only had a day to stress. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Kate and be blessed by her testimony. Come on up, Kate. Well, I didn't really have a day of stress because I was so busy yesterday that I didn't have time to think about it. So, <laughs> here I am. Um, I grew up in a Christian home and I went to church and read my Bible. And, um, as a little girl, I remember there were a number of times that I said a cute little prayer and I went and told my parents that I was saved. And I'm not sure the exact day that I was saved. Um, basically, as I grew up, I didn't, I went to Sunday school, but I don't remember learning much about God in Sunday school. I just don't remember that. What I learned of God was mostly just through reading my Bible. You know, all through my childhood, I wanted to please God more than anything. I wanted to know God more. And that was just you know, all I wanted. And so I would read my Bible and study it for myself. Um, as I got older, I think I was about 14 when we started going to a church where I started really getting some solid biblical teaching, and when I was 16, I was baptized, and it was actually about the time we lived here, I was 18 years old, and I was on Main Street, passing out gospel tracts, and I started wondering, well, how do I know that I really am saved? It's like, I thought that I was saved, and I went through, and it's like, okay, I could see the fruit, I could see the evidence in my life. You know, and it was like, I don't know, I knew that I was saved at the same time. It was like, I wanted to be sure. I had to be sure. So I started studying my Bible, and I took, it, it was like a month that I studied my Bible and just tried to figure it out. It was like, it wasn't enough. I had to know. I was telling people, and was it really, you know, did I have what I was sharing with everyone else? And I started wondering, well, what exactly is it? that makes me saved. And finally, it was something that I read by Mac and Debbie Pearl. Um, I realized that when I, I had basically started questioning my faith. I was asking myself, do I have enough faith to be saved? When I started asking myself if I had enough faith to be saved, I had made it about works, about myself. And I realized that I just needed to look at Jesus. I was saved because I believed in Jesus. It wasn't from praying so much prayer. It wasn't because I grew up in a Christian home and went to church. And, you know, it wasn't anything of myself. It was just Jesus. And from that point forward, I started pointing people just to Jesus. To say. And I guess my testimony kind of ties in with Ben's a little bit because that fall, something prompted me to pray for the salvation of my future husband. And I remember at the time thinking, this is silly. Surely he's already saved by now. I'm 18 years old. But for some reason, I did pray. I diligently prayed from November through February. It was that February that he was saved. A couple months later, he was baptized and started coming to this church, and I didn't even realize it. So, basically, that is my story. <laughs> comprehend what you're telling them, but they have not yet 
apprehend. Okay, the difference is comprehend means you understand something. Apprehend means you take hold of it. Okay? And that's one of the struggles we have in ministry is you can fake Christianity. I mean, you can go through the motions, you can polish yourself up, and walk the walk, and talk the talk in front of believers, but salvation is something that is birthed in here, not here. You see, if you can figure it out, then it's not salvation. That's too small. It's not sufficient. I mean, his salvation base is based on his grace. And his grace covers all sin. We, we can't fathom the depths of his grace. And so, when, you know, I, I hear people's testimony, and I say, oh, I grew up in a Christian home. Red flag goes up. Because that's like people saying, you know, no offense, Ben, but I was born a Catholic. What? You were born a Catholic? What, what procedure did they do on you? <laughs> the archdiocese procedure or something. I, I don't know how that works. You're not born, you know. And for people to say, you know, their faith is based on the fact they grew up in church. I grew up in a Christian home. You know, I attended Sunday school and got all gold stars. Those are all works-based things. See, there's, there's only one way to salvation, and that's through the cross. And you can't do anything because it's already been done. You know, all you can do is accept what's been done. That's it. That's it. And so, you know, that's, that's one of my biggest struggles, um, you know, I watch some of the kids in youth group and, and they know the words. They've heard it all before and you start talking to them about salvation and something in their brain goes, eee! and I want to get those defibrillator paddles and just go, quack, because I want that to start moving again. And I wonder sometimes how many people in here on a Sunday are just going, eee! because you've heard it all before. You've comprehended, but you've yet to apprehend. You've yet to take a hold of it. We're in our essentials, the essentials of our faith. What is essential for us to believe to have fellowship? We've been talking about this for a while. We've covered the inerrancy of Scripture. We've talked about monotheism. And then went right into... Trinitarianism. So we have one God who is coexistent, co-eternal, in three parts. And we, we actually spent quite a bit of time looking through the Old Testament to see that God has always revealed himself in a plurality, in three parts, always. Okay? We started looking at the different parts, God the Father spent quite a bit of time on God the Son because we had to talk about God the Son, the virgin birth, the cross, and the empty tomb. We had to discuss those things because those are essential. Okay? And without understanding those, without really believing those, we don't have a shared basis for faith. Because if you don't believe that he was immaculately conceived, then he can't be all God and all man. And if you don't believe that he's all God and all man, he was insufficient to pay the price on the cross. In Hebrews, you can just rip that out of your Bible and throw it away. Okay? And if we don't believe that he was sufficient to the cross, then the shared faith that we have in our salvation is pointless. And if we don't believe that God resurrected him from the dead, Paul says, and we of all people are without hope. Okay? So we, we've talked about some of the essentials and, and why I believe these are essentials. And today we're moving on to the third part of the Trinity. We're going to talk about the Holy Ghost. Okay, the Holy Spirit. 
And I, I told Christy earlier this week, I said, I fully expect that nobody is going to be satisfied with what I say to you. I want you to keep in mind, what we are talking about today are essentials, not non-essentials. You see, that's the biggest problem that Christians have today in dealing with each other, is we make the non-essentials essential. And we say, it has to be this way, or we cannot fellowship. And God says, but, but, no, no, stop. Don't, that's not essential. That's not essential. So, I fully expect nobody to be happy with what I'm going to say. <laughs> because I think you're going to be surprised at what the essentials are. Okay? So first... The Holy Spirit is God. That's essential. You have to believe the Holy Spirit is God. And we'll take a look at some scriptures that are, are going to back this up. I'm actually going to fly through the scriptures pretty quick because we have a lot of different areas that I want to touch on. I did give you a handout today um, in your bulletin. Now, I'm not really going to address this very much, but these are the works of the Holy Spirit in, in scripture. You can go through and look at them at your leisure. Uh, these are things that the Holy Spirit has done. Um, like He intercedes. He convicts of sin. He, these are all things that the Holy Spirit does. I want to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. Not about what He does. Because a lot of times we get too caught up in what He does and doesn't do. Or what we think He does or doesn't do. And that leads to a lot of conflict. And, and quite honestly, that's not really the point of today's message. Okay? The point of today's message is this. We have to believe that the Holy Spirit is who God's Word says He is. All right? Now, even that right there is problematic. You know why? Can anybody tell me why that's problematic? What? Because I said He. And people go, whoa, 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 whoa. He's a spirit. Well, you just said he too. It's a spirit. It's not an it. <laughs> okay. And God's word reveals God's spirit to be he. So I'm referring to it just as God's word does. It's not because I'm biased. Okay. All I'm doing is just quoting what God says. All right. So the Holy Spirit is spirit. <clears throat> All right. He doesn't have a physical form like Jesus the Son does. Okay. So, uh, the, the, the clearest reference we have is he's like the wind. Okay? It goes here and there, and we can't see it, but we know it by what it does. Okay? So, let's, let's take a look at some scriptures. First, we need to understand, going back to our illustration on the Trinity, do you still have that on there? Can you put that up? It was on there last week, I saw it. We're gonna, I'll, I'll give him a minute to do that. As the third part of the Trinity, third not in significance, we're not rating them like God the Father's number one, he gets the gold medal. God the Son is second place, he gets the silver medal, and the Holy Spirit gets the bronze medal. Although, quite honestly, I think intellectually we do that. We think like God Senior, God Junior, and God Light. And, and we tend to relegate God's Spirit to God light. And we don't give it Him the significance and relevance that He is worthy of. Not yet? Still coming. Okay. Because if we really believe in a Trinitarian view of God, that there is three parts coexistent, co-eternal, coexistent, co-eternal, then the Spirit would be God. Right? And all the devotion and all the adoration, all the admiration all the study, all the love would be poured out to God the Spirit just as much as God the Father and God the Son. Right? But do we do that? Do we do that? Quite honestly, personally, all right, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to freak a lot of you guys out. Please don't get up and run away. Hear me out. Okay? I grew up Pentecostal. Okay? And, and I had a very skewed view of the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? Now, 
I don't want to say I've come out of that, but I've come out of that. Okay? Because I believe God is very clear in his word as to what is appropriate. And, and I think a lot of times in Pentecostal circles, the spirit of God becomes a decoration. It's a bottle. You know, it's, it's like a really cool emblem you get to wear on your chest. You know, and you walk around and it's like, <laughs> yeah, oh, spirit, me. Shabbat <laughs> Now, Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not getting into the gifts of the spirit today. Quite honestly, you want to talk to me about tongues? Come and talk to me about tongues afterward. I think you'll be shocked at where I stand on tongues. Okay? But, growing up, um, the Holy Spirit was not really thought of as God. He was thought of more as like um, Santa Claus. Okay? And so, um, we got it? Here we go. This is our little diagram for the Trinity. All are God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. It goes the other way. The Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. Now this is important. Okay? It's very important that we grasp this and hold on to this. Because there are a lot of cults out there that want to change this. Some of them want to put this in a chronological order. The Father was first. And then at some point in time, the Father became the Son and came to earth and was no longer the Father. And then at some point became the Spirit and ascended back to heaven. And so is not the Son, nor is He the Father anymore. That's not true. All three, coexistent. They exist at the same time. They always have existed. Always. Okay? So we need to understand that it wasn't like at some point throughout the Old Testament, we hit the intertestamental period and God fragmented himself. <laughs> and three different parts went flying off. Okay? That, that didn't happen. Okay? Because look at creation. We see God the Father speaking. We see the Holy Spirit hovering. And John tells us that it was through the Word, who is Jesus, that all things were made. Okay, so we see all three components at the start of what we think of things. Now, we only call it the start because it's relative to us. God was already existent. There is no start. He already existed. So when we refer to a start, it's only as pertains to us. All right? It's also important because the Son is God. The Son is not the Father. Um, the Spirit is God. And there's not this, this weird um, idea that, you know, God had multiple children with, with, with wives and, and they, they became gods in and of themselves. So here's something that I think surprises a lot of Christians today. You're never going to be God. Okay? You're not going to at some point ascend to a higher state of deity. You're, you're not. He's God, we're not. And it's always going to be that way. It always has been that way and it always will be that way. Now, we will be transformed into a glorified body. Thank God for that. I don't want to live with this for eternity. All right? But the transformation is going to be glorious, but we're not going to become God. Okay? So... We have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now, I want to talk to you about the person of the Holy Spirit because see, there's another idea out there that the Holy Spirit really isn't a person. He's just a force. He's some kind of energy that floats around and does dynamic things, and, and it's like electricity. And let me tell you, 110 is nothing. 220 stinks. Okay? Because when you get hit by 220, it hurts. 110 just kind of shocks you up a little bit. 220 throws you across the room and bounces you off the walls. I don't like 220 at all. God is not like electricity that just floats around zapping people, 110 or 220. Okay, that's not what his spirit is about. So we're going to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. One, he speaks. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. Don't 
bother turning. If you want the references, I'll happily make copies of my notes. You can go back and check them out later. Um, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Okay? Now this is at the start of Paul and Barnabas', Barnabas first missionary journey. Uh, they're worshiping together. The Holy Spirit speaks. Okay? Two, he has emotion. He can be grieved. He can be offended. We see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. He says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Okay? As far as I know, electricity is never offended. He acts. 1 Corinthians 12. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, electricity doesn't have a will. Electricity simply does. Okay? God's Spirit has a will. He acts. Okay? He chooses to do or not do. All of these things pointing back to the fact that he's not just a force. He's a person. Okay? He has a ministry. Did you, did you know that? Did you know that God's Spirit has a ministry? What is the ministry of God's Spirit? Not, not what does He do, but what is His ministry? John chapter 15, verse 26. This is Jesus speaking. He says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about me. Did you know that was the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Did you know that? His job, his purpose, the thing that he is tasked to do, that he goes about doing, is to bear witness to Jesus. Now what's really funny about that is, see, we, we look at all three parts that are co-equal, but they understand submission. Did you know that? See, that's, that's where we get really hung up in the church. Because we, we want everybody to be equal means everybody does the same thing. Okay? So let's try that in church one day. Right now, everybody get up and preach. Go. Oh, come on. Here, you can have my notes. I'll give you one page. I'll give you one page. We'll, we'll, we'll all get up and preach. Okay, how about we do this? How about everybody cleans the bathroom? Ready, go. Well, how would it work? See, we, we all want it to be everybody is equal, but we need to understand that God has an order that he has set for things to work properly. Now, God didn't just, in arrogance, look down and say, all right, I'm going to choose to do it this way because I'm God and I get to do that. He could have, because he is God, and he could do that. But you understand that what he gave us is simply a reflection of what he has already done in himself. Okay? Let's look at this. The Father sent the Son. John 3.16. Right? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. Alright? So Jesus, who being equal with God, was sent of God. Does that mean that the God cracked the whip, that God the Father cracked the whip and sent his Son? No. Jesus submitted himself willingly underneath that authority. Why? Because he knew that was what was necessary. We see it again in the garden. Jesus is praying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Take this away from me. But not as I will, as you will. He submits himself to that authority. Now, keeping in mind, when Jesus was on earth, he was fully man. That's the part that's saying, let this cup pass from me. But he's also fully God, and he can say, no. I am not going to do this. Man has offended me. He deserves eternity separated from me. He deserves eternity of torment. I choose not to. It was within not only his rights, but it was within his ability to do that. And he chose not to. Okay? So we see submission from father to son, but we also see Jesus refers twice to the sending of the Holy Spirit. The first time he says, I will ask my father to send his spirit. The second time I just quoted 
Jesus says, I will send to you the Spirit. It's better that I go so the Spirit can come. Okay? We see they choose to submit. Why? Because then the purposes can be accomplished. And we, we see this all too often in the church. We get people get all uptight. Ooh, you can't tell me what to do. Hey. What is that? Pride. Pride. Well, you know, if you ever really want a bummer of a study, go through Scripture and look at how often God talks about pride and hold your life, life up in light of it. Yikes. Because he reminds us, mm, you, you don't, nothing you have is yours. I gave it all to you. Your talents, your abilities, your car, your job. And, and we so easily fall into, oh, look what I can do. See, I did. No, you didn't. <coughs> because if God didn't give you the abilities to do that, you wouldn't have been able to do that. Okay? So, we see a voluntary submission. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We see that played out in the church. We see that played out in Christianity. Why? Because God chooses to work it that way? Yeah, but it's also because it's a reflection of who He is. God chooses it to work that way because it works best. See, we, we get this whole thing backwards with the pride issue. We come humbly, and He lifts us up. We come pridefully, and He smacks us down. So we humble ourselves, and then He chooses to lift us up. Okay? God can lift me up a lot higher than I can lift myself. God can lift you up a lot higher than you can lift yourself. As high as you think you can get yourself on your own, God can take you much further than you. Okay? Okay. So, the Spirit. His ministry. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit another section here. All of these are pointing to the fact that He is God. Okay? Because we also have to understand that. He's not God-like. He's not just a force sent out from God to do things like like God sends out the lightning, you, you know, in, in Job and in Psalms it says that God sends forth His lightning. Okay, in 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 Job it actually says that He sends it forth and it comes back and reports to Him. Isn't that a cool thought? Isn't that a cool picture? So, all of these things, all these scriptures that I'm going to go through next are showing us God's Spirit is God. Okay, so this is completing the Trinity picture that we started. A month and a half, two months ago. All right? So, Acts chapter 5. This is Ananias and Sapphira. You know the story. The, the church was coming together. They were selling their possessions and bringing the money in that the church could distribute it so that he that had much did not have too much and he that had too little did not have too little. So that everybody had. Okay? And Ananias and Sapphira... Ananias, the husband, decides to sell his property. He wants to get in on the action. He wants to be thought well of. Sapphira, his wife, with full knowledge of what he was doing, they sell their property, and they keep a portion of it back for themselves. And then they bring it, and they lay the portion at the, the apostles' feet and say, here it is. And, and uh, Peter goes, is this all? Yeah. Sign me up for a deacon. I'll give you the stamp. I'll give you the envelope. And this is what Peter says. So starting in verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have not, uh, why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Now, just to finish the story so you guys understand what happened. It wasn't a matter of giving or not giving. That, that's irrelevant. That, that's not the issue here. The issue is that Ananias came and was saying, this is all. He lied. And he was offending God. You've you got to remember that sin is always first an offense to God. Even sin committed against you directly is first an offense to God. <clears throat> Okay? So you need to keep that in mind because every sin is an offense before God that is taken care of at the cross. Okay? That's why in, in the Lord's Prayer, when he gets to the end, he starts talking about us forgiving people. And he says, by the measure you forgive, you will be forgiven. 
Because how can you come to the cross and ask him to take away all the garbage that you've done in your life, will do in your life, and are doing in your life, and yet not forgive somebody else for the offense that they might commit against you? No, we of all people should be forgiven. Because we know what we've been forgiven. Right? So, the offense was the lie. So, but did you catch what said in those two verses? He says, first, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then in the very next verse, he says, you have not lied to man, but to God. So Peter's making it very clear. As far as Peter's concerned, the Holy Spirit is God. Now, we can get really trippy. We can get into, you know, the man is, is three components, body, soul, and spirit. And, you know, it's like the, the spirit is as much of me as the body and the soul. And, and, and But they, that's really kind of ethereal. It's kind of like out there because we don't really know, like, what part is spirit and what part is soul. And, and both of them are somehow stuffed into this body, which is why I need to eat more so there's more room for more soul. <laughs> No. But, but Peter is making it very clear here. And keeping in mind that this is written under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He is speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this is inspired word of God. He is saying God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is God. All right? So moving forward. He is eternal. Now, we're going to jump back. I want you guys to go back a uh, uh, couple years. One of the first series that I did was talking about the nature of God. And one of the things that we talked about was that God is transcendent, which means he's above us. He's so far removed from us that we really can't comprehend him. Okay? But then we talked about he was omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He, these, these are attributes of God. He's eternal. He has no beginning and no end. So we're going to take a look at some of these things because Scripture defines the Holy Spirit in the exact same way. He's eternal. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciousness from the dead works to serve the living God? And that's not the scripture that I wanted. <laughs> Hang on a second. I don't know where I got that scripture from, but it's a good scripture. File that one away. We'll come back to that one. I, I got to go back to my notes because I try and clean up my notes before service on Sunday because otherwise it'd be a mess and uh, I clean for them. So, he is eternal. Oh, we already talked about that because we see at the beginning of time, God's spirit was, it held it over the waters. We see at the end of the time, the spirit says, what? You know, Revelation, what does he say? And the spirit says, Come. Right? Okay. So, did you know that he was omnipresent? David tells us he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Now, this is actually, this kind of surprised me because I'm, I'm pretty thick. I'm, I'm slow on the uptake sometimes. Sometimes, you know, I have to get something like 76 times before I understand it. Um, in Psalms, David writes, uh, Psalm 139, he says, where shall I go from your spirit? Now, this is, uh, right here it says, where shall I go from your spirit? He's talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, right? But I didn't get that. I'm just thinking God, because God is spirit, right? And and when I read this, and I went back and I read it again, it's like, oh, I never even connected that with the Holy Spirit. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Now this is this is a scripture that I use often <clears throat> because I know wherever I am, whatever I'm feeling, God has promised me He's there. Even when I feel absolutely and utterly alone, He has promised me He is there. As a matter of fact, He has promised me even there your hand shall lead me. And he's not saying like this. He's saying like this. This way. This is how we're going. This way. This way. 
<laughs> he has taken me in his hand. And I understand that because the word also tells me whom God has taken his hand, none can shake loose. Right? Personal, intimate. One of the things that you'll see about the ministry of Jesus being fully God and fully man is he touched people. I love the illustrations. The leper comes up and what does he do? Touches him. He reaches out and touches him. And that makes all kinds of problems with the law because now Jesus is unclean. But now he's healed. So at what point does the Talmud make clean and unclean? The children. I love the way that Jesus dealt with children. I love the way he dealt with them. Why? Because it wasn't enough that, I mean, they're, they're like kids. Boop. Boop. Don't offend the master. The rabbi's busy. And Jesus says, okay, bring them to me. Bring them to me. And then he uses them as illustrations and says, you've got to become like one of these. You want to see heaven? You've got to be like these. But he doesn't stop there. What does he do? Contact. See, that's something that we don't like to think about God. I mean, we, we tend to put God up on that, that ethereal throne and we don't dare approach. And, but then he sends a son and what does this son do? He touches people. He goes into the ugly places. He goes into the tax collectors and the sinners. And he touches them. <gasps> now, I'm going to bring that up to modern day. How many of you would have a problem if you saw me ministering to someone in a bar? Pharisee. <laughs> yeah. No, because we all struggle with things like that. Okay? We all struggle with things like that. The point is, God is intimate. Okay? By his hand, he leads me. He takes me as he, he holds me. Alright? So his spirit is omnipotent. This is really cool. Okay? Because this is something we can't do. Luke chapter 1. You know what we're going to talk about, Luke chapter 1, right? Do you know the Holy Spirit can do anything? We already talked about Him being involved in creation. Uh, where, you know, uh, in one of your, your passages there that I gave you, we know that He's part of regeneration, the redemption of man. But, but here's something that's kind of really cool. In uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 35, it says, An angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child who will be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. <clears throat> God, Spirit, created light. Improbably. I would say impossibly, but He did it, so it's not impossible. Improbably. He, he created light in a way that we could never create light. Because the way God designed it, you need man and woman to come together to create life. But God chose a woman who had never been with a man, and his spirit came upon her, and he did what for us is impossible. He created life. Okay? So we see that the attributes that the Holy Spirit exhibits declare him to be God. So if he is a person and not a force, and he is God, and not something sent out from God, a, a force, a electricity, wind, dunamis, power, whatever, then we have to start rethinking how we approach and deal with the Spirit of God. Don't we? Don't we need to be equally as honoring to the Spirit? as we are to the Father and the Son. You see, here's, here's the thing. God set the plan in motion. The plan was fulfilled through Jesus at the cross. But Jesus said that wasn't sufficient as far as his work in our lives. It was sufficient unto salvation. Don't get me wrong there. That's all that was needed for salvation. But it wasn't sufficient as far as God's work in our life. So he was going to send to us God's Spirit that seals us. It's a seal. Look, if, if you don't have God's Spirit, you're not saved. 
It's as simple as that. Okay? Because it is the seal of the promise of salvation. When you come to the cross, when you receive salvation, you receive God's Spirit. Boop. Done. Okay? And at that moment, for all eternity, you receive everything you need as pertaining to life and godliness. Everything that's needed. Now, keep in mind, God exists at all time at the same time. So for him to give you something that you're going to need 20 years from now is not a big deal. He already, he's already there 20 years from now, already dealing with that issue. Okay, so don't, don't get tripped up by this. Because I, we can start rationalizing and get logical and go, oh, well, you know, this and that and the other in Scripture and, and His Spirit did this here, but then it didn't do this until later. And it, don't, don't get tripped up about that. That's the cool part about serving a God that is bigger than you. Because quite honestly, if God was only as big as you, I wouldn't be a Christian. And neither would you. Okay? It takes something bigger than us for us to be saved. And his spirit is part of that. So when Jesus left, you see in Acts chapter 2, the sending of the Holy Spirit, we see it was done with dynamic signs. Okay? And that's that's the thing that I, I always get. We're not even going to go there. Stop. Stop. I'm not going to go there. I said I wasn't going to go there. I'm not going to go there. We see it was done with signs. Okay? One of the other things that we see is when Paul is ministering and he's talking to the Corinthians, he says, you know, when, when I came to you, I didn't come with the wisdom of man or with eloquence of speech. Because he said, I, 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 I didn't come with fancy talking. Why? Because I don't want you to believe me because of me, because I was able to convince you. I wanted you to believe the one that sent me. So how did he come? Demonstration of the Spirit's power. 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 Why? That you might believe the one who sent me. Look, if you guys are here, I'm not saying this is the case at all. If you guys are here because you think I got something, you're in the wrong place. Okay? I got nothing. In and of myself, nothing. Nada. Zip, zilch. The big togu wabo. Nothing. Don't ever look to me, okay? Because I'm going to fail you. Look to the one we serve. That's where the answers lie. Now, he can use me to provide an answer to you. He can use you to provide an answer to me. God can use any tool that is willing, and, and even tools that are not willing. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. Boy, he got cocky, didn't he? So God's Spirit, one, He is a person, not a thing. Two, He is God. Co-equal, co-eternal. He is God. Every bit as much as God the Father and God the Son. And He is with us right now. He has promised us that. Okay? In about and throughout us. He is my seal of salvation that I know that the cross was efficacious. Fancy word for it's effective. It worked. Okay? I know that the empty tomb is empty, that I have hope that my tomb will be empty, <clears throat> that there is going to be life after. Now, my hope is None of us sitting here in this room got to go into a tomb. I hope he just comes back and takes us off. Yeah. <laughs> Done. I'm cool with that. But I'm not going to let that perturb me. Because he's promised me. And he's promised you. And it's, we don't even have to wait. It's not like the Old Testament. <clears throat> but what happens? To be absent from the body is to be... <laughs> That's right. That's right. Be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, he's not talking about that man when you watch football. 
Because I've seen some of you watch football, and there's nobody in that body. <laughs> you guys are out there on the field, chasing the football down and yelling at the quarterback and yelling at the referee. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. Okay? So, to be absent from the body, man, that's our great and glorious hope. Amen? Okay. So, I know you guys can come, you can attack me afterwards, because I didn't answer a lot of questions. I intentionally chose not to answer a lot of questions, because they're not essential. Okay? They're not essential. I'm not saying they're not important. Don't get me wrong. They're important, but they're not essential. Okay? Alright? Now, I'm just going to ask one thing. Okay? Okay. Father, we bless you today. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your spirit. Father, it convicts us in sin. It reminds us when we're off track. It points us into the direction we should go. Father, it comforts us in our affliction. Father, it teaches us. Your spirit is ever present. As your word says, we cannot go anywhere that your spirit is not already there. We thank you, Father, that in your divine wisdom and providence, you sent your spirit. We bless you for this. I ask, Father, that you would give us wisdom and understanding. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.